This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. My name is Roger Jelinek. I'm the host of ThinkTech Bookworlds. And my guest today is uh, Malia Malik McManus, uh, the author of uh, Dragon Fruit, a historical novel. Uh, and uh, so here we are, Malia. Thank you for having thanks me. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Um, tell us a bit about yourself. You are actually pretty well known anyway, but mm -hmm. for the purposes of this interview. Oh, you're very you know, kind, yeah. thank you. Uh, I was born and raised in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and um, my father's family is from Hawaii. My mom is from Nebraska, and after uh, doing some time away, I came back and worked as a reporter for about 10 years, a reporter and anchor. And I've continued to do a bit of television and a bit of writing. and. Um, yeah, and I live here with my family, my husband, and our two boys. And you have two boys, yeah. Yeah, ages yeah. 9 and 12, yes. You burst into print. <laughs> with, uh, you want to show them the Sure, Hawaiian, yes. It's been uh, a few years, it's yeah. It's called The Hawaiian House, uh, which was a selection of uh, the, the most, your favorite houses or the most beautiful houses. Yes. Yeah, so published by Abrams mm -hmm. about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, just give us a little bit of a story on that. You know? You know, it was a collaboration with Jean Jean Bauer and uh, Lenny Morris, who's a, an incredibly talented photographer, and the three of us just thought it would be uh, fun to take a look at some various houses around the state, and um, it, it's been a while. I think it's been about 12 years, I, I, I think, and um, it was a work of love, and we had a, a great time doing it, and it was with Abrams out of New York, and yeah. And well, Abrams is a major art book publisher. So yes, we were pretty very... Pretty grand entry you did at the publishing. Though. Definitely, yeah. and it was thanks to Linny. Linny had the credentials and the connections to get Abrams, so that was all thanks to Linny. And uh, yeah, I actually just did a book signing for my next book in Kailua at a wonderful bookends um, bookstore, and uh, the owner, Pat Benning, was just saying that some German tourists had come in and bought a few copies that very day, so it's still selling, so, still so that's alive. great, yeah. No. So how do you get from that to historical novel? <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, it was a circuitous route. I had two children, and um, I had uh, stopped working full-time in the news, and I had some time while they were napping, and I started to think about stories that I had grown up with that I had stuck with me and experiences, and I started to think I had always dreamt of doing fiction and been a big fiction reader, uh, particularly historical fiction. And um, I would take the children, um, first my first son and then when I had both, to Bishop Museum a lot because it was cool and in the shade and I would walk them around in their strollers and just look at all of these gorgeous objects, the feather capes, and then I would also um, sometimes go to Iolani Palace. I went again and again during both pregnancies just because, again, it was cool. And I would listen to the different docents tell the stories of the various rooms, and it all just started to brew in my head. It took a long time to put it together um, because of the children and, and just taking a tremendous amount of time to do research. But uh, it came together in this, in, in Dragon Fruit. Just give us the premise of the book. Um, yeah. You know? So it's yeah. set um, <clears throat> between the years of 1891 and 1900, which, as we all know, was an incredibly tumultuous time here and in, in the overthrow. And uh, it is from the viewpoint of a woman named Eliza, whose mother is from whaling stock and whose father is a missionary plantation stock. And I chose her as the narrator because I wanted to talk about these events, but I felt that it wasn't my place to talk about them from a Native Hawaiian point of view because I'm not, sadly, Native Hawaiian. And so I felt it was important for the narrator to be outside of that point of view, but have some credibility to it. And so in the book, um, she is childhood friends with Princess Ka'iolani, which is consistent with um, in the research I did when Ka'iolani was a child. You'll see a lot of photographs, and she very much was raised, you know, with a lot of the missionary and plantation children around her as as playmates and and at her birthday parties. And so uh, Eliza became my narrator, and it tells a story of sort of the loss uh, for the wider community during the overthrow. Um, and then her personal story, which is, uh, in, involves some pretty dramatic events that take her to Molokai and back. Just to, uh, for, by way of uh, background for further getting into the story, uh, just run through the overthrow from the point of view that you took, which is an unusual mm -hmm. one. Uh, yeah. Then. So in the book, her father is friends with and close to an ally of 
uh, Kalakaua mm -hmm. and um, feels a loyalty there. And so he chooses to not support the overthrow, which other plantation families, not all plantation families, but some plantation families were espousing. And so he's sort of on the on the losing side, if you will. And then after the overthrow, um, suffers sort of the consequences of that. And that's based a little bit in some distant family history um, of my father's family. And again, these are distant relatives, but who were not plantation people. But um, I had always been told had had allied themselves more with that point of view. And that had stuck with me. What would that be like to be, you know? Um, Anglo-Saxon white uh, American and um, and be choosing to side with the king and with the royal family and with the queen and that was the premise the political premise and then the, the next there's a subplot with Eliza and um, the Chinese element yes you know? and that was a lot of fun to write um, there's a romance and she is in love with basically the boy next door and he is the product of a Hawaiian Howley mother and a Chinese father and uh, you know, the book is dedicated to Heather Ho, and she was a best friend uh, growing up. And you know, we lost her in New York in 9-11. In so I had always wanted to dedicate it to her because she brought so much joy and excitement to life. But I also, because it was going to, I always knew, be dedicated to her, I wanted to bring in um, sort of a, a Chinese element to it and look at the Chinese community in Hawaii. And that was so much fun, getting to ask friends about their stories and try to bring that element into it and there uh, were some real characters the the character in this book is fictional but there was a lot of real life inspiration there were some amazing stories of men who came over and made fortunes here in Hawaii and were very um, politically powerful and I, I wanted to include that so that the her love interest in the beginning of the book is is the, the product of that and his his father was uh, very close to Kalakaua, yes. through the uh, opium trade. Well, you What's know, the background there? Well, <clears throat> and I, I do want to caution, I don't want to present myself as sort of a specialist in Hawaiian mm. history because I do not have a degree in it, and um, I simply sat down and read everything I could get my hands on. But my understanding from my reading and my research is that, you know, opium was legal in Hawaii, and at one point there was a, a permit that was issued to, to you know, sell it, sell it legally. Um, and that uh, the Chinese community in Hawaii uh, did an amazing job of, of thinking through how to go after that permit for it to be sold legally. There is a lot of um, talk in the history books about how it was not contained to the Chinese community that, um, you know, this was a, a, a really profitable um, element of the economy here and in California, actually. There was a lot of that going on there from what I've read. And then it did become illegal at, at some point, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Eliza, the heroine's father, mm. um, had a, a different um, uh, a different future for her than transpired. What, what was what was? I mean, it was an arranged marriage he had in mind. Yeah. Well, almost an arranged marriage. Right. Um, well, so the opening uh, pages, you know, mm -hmm. from the opening pages, that um, Eliza basically has a choice presented from by her father, which I felt was accurate with the times, which is. She is pregnant. She's not married. Um, the boy she loves has been sent back to China because of political events here, and she's alone. And so he either presents her with the choice of going back to Boston to some distant relatives and having the child and giving it up to an orphanage and coming back as if, you know, she's been on a trip and never seeing the child again, or he will find a husband for her to make the child legitimate, and she chooses the latter. And that's the beginning of sort of her her adventure and uh, you know her tragedy if you will and her redemption and everything else so yeah. and uh, that takes her to Molokai yes which, exactly uh, was as different then as mm -hmm. it is different today mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Uh, tell us about Molokai at that time, and, uh, as you describe it in the story. Yeah, you know? well, again, I, I don't want to put myself forward as a specialist on Molokai, but I just read absolutely everything I could find, and I found it completely fascinating. And some of the events in the book actually happened and are based on letters, letters that I uh, read. Um, I have a scene in which uh, uh, cows are jumping off of the path down to Kalapapa and exploding in oh, sort of pink clouds. That, scene, that yeah. actually really happened, yeah. and that was, a um, you know, written about in quite a few places that I uh, that I was able to do research and I found it just 
fascinating that this actually happened. And that's the funny thing about so many of the events. It is fiction, but so many of the events and instances and descriptions in the book are true. And you know, truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah. It's hard to believe. Yeah. No. So. So she goes to Molokai, and what, why does she go to Molokai? Uh, no. The husband he has found for her, who is willing to be paid off to marry her, is uh, the manager of a ranch above Kalapapa. And um, so she, she is thrown into that world, which is very different from sort of the palace life that she had been a part of here um, in Honolulu. And the house consists of one room, as far as I remember. Yes, yes. And, and is, <clears throat> again, very consistent with what I, I read about uh, what Molokai was like at that, at that time. And, of course, there was leprosy going on, and that's part of the book as well, and the tragedy of that. And, um, you know, also I think um, I tried to balance out some of the harder things that are in the book with some of the joy. Um, and you know, Hawaii and Honolulu was a very, very, it still is a beautiful place, but it was a phenomenally beautiful place at the end of the 19th century. So I did a lot of reading. They talked about how you could walk, um, if you were able to, you could walk on the top of treetops from Nu'uanu to the palace on unbroken ca um, canopy of monkey pod trees. And that really stuck with my mind and, and is in there. And a lot of the legends that I grew up, you know, a, a lot of um, the stories I think we all grew up with. Uh, at camp in Hawaii and stuff, the night marchers and, and the different gods. And I wanted to incorporate all of that into the story. I was fascinated in the, in the Molokai section about her relationship to the local kids. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, tell, tell us a little about that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, one of the things that the missionaries did really, really well from what I read is that uh, the level of literacy was very, very high in Hawaii at that time. So I did want to balance out some of the things that might have been a more negative impact of the missionaries with, you know, literacy was really high. And so I wanted to write the children on Molokai as um, being, uh, you know, reflective of the fact that they were sort of caught between these different worlds that were going on. On one hand, um, the native Hawaiians were losing so much and there was so much disease. On the other hand, they were going to these schools and I felt like the children that she would have known there would have been reflective of uh, these children who could navigate many of these different worlds and were needing to, you know, and there, I did feel um, when you read about that time, it makes you very, very sad about what happened. Uh, but you also, I think, read about different characters who, who became tremendously strong and tremendously uh, talented leaders in the Hawaiian community because they, they rose to the occasion, you know. Yeah. Well, well, we'll leave Molokai and we'll go back to Honolulu in mm. a moment. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I have the exquisite pleasure of hosting a Think Tech Hawaii program titled Old Green. I have some of Hawaii's and the mainland's most fascinating energy efficiency experts as my guests, and each one of them brings us a bit closer to realizing Hawaii's goal of 100% clean energy by the year 2045. For the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech. will run only during the month of November, and you can help. Please donate what you can so that Think Tech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free, free programming like mine. I have already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, www.thinkforthinktech.cause.com. On behalf of the community enriched by Think Tech Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, thank you for your generosity. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Here we are, <coughs> back again. Uh, we were on Molokai, and now we're going to go back to Honolulu because the heroine mm -hmm. manages to get away. Uh, gets away in a pretty interesting way. Mm -hmm. Just tell us how she got away. Should I save it for people who haven't read it? I don't know if it's if it's a surprise exactly. I mean, uh, leave it, yeah, I guess I can say it involves her, um, you know, experiencing what being in Kalapapa 
is like and, and what it was like at that point. And I got to visit Kalapapa and actually stay um, with patients thanks to a group of friends who were traveling together. And um, Nainoa Thompson very kindly took a group of us there. And I got to spend, I think, a few nights and really see what it would be like to have lived there. And that was amazing and something I definitely wanted to that's put in the book. Pretty, that's mm -hmm. pretty unusual. It was, I, it was, I don't think I, <clears throat> it's very unusual for people to stay over there. Yeah, well, it was very generous. And the patients were amazing. Yeah. And uh, so you know, open with their stories. And I, I did want to include sort of some of just more of the impressions and the, the feeling of the place yeah. and, and what they sort of uh, conveyed in, in what was the beauty of living there, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. So she gets back to Honolulu. Um, and it's the eve of the overthrow, or rather it is the overthrow, yeah, really. It is yeah. the overthrow. Yeah. Um, first, just tell us about what it was like to research that, because yeah. and how, do you, how do you select? I mean, there's a lot of material on that. Yeah, a there lot was, of anger about mm -hmm. it, obviously. Yeah, no. and there's almost, almost <laughs> too much material. I mean, yeah. I could have spent another 10 years, you know, because yeah. there is so much material. And, um, you know, I, I really didn't want to uh, touch anything that was, it, it is such a hurtful event, and um, I didn't want anyone to feel as if I thought that I was a specialist on it or had the complete understanding of it. Um, so that is why I felt Eliza is a, she's an insider and yet she's an outsider, and she's telling her sliver of the story. And well, she wasn't a specialist, right? Yeah. Exactly. She's yeah. just experiencing it through her eyes yeah. and her father's position. And you know, any one of the characters in the book could write the story from their perspective, and you could have a completely different history of it. But, um, you know, I think my visit, biggest hesitation about completing this book was uh, so many friends are Native Hawaiian, and I would never want the community to feel that anyone had sort of decided that this, what's their story was mine to tell. But I did feel like the history uh, warrants as much attention as it can, uh, you know, receive because it's such an important thing that happened and, and it needs to be talked about. And so I felt as if, if I wrote it from the perspective of a young, you know, Howley girl that, you know, she's seeing it with a tremendous amount of sympathy for what is happening to Native Hawaiians, but she herself is not Native Hawaiian. So I wanted to make sure the narrator was that. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I wanted to handle it with uh, as much respect as I could, and so far the reception has been really, really good, which has made me well, feel I, good. I, I can't imagine any Native Hawaiian writer wanting to write a book about the overthrow from Elizabeth's point right. of view. Right, so it's you know. Elizabeth's point <coughs> yeah, of view, yeah. or Eliza's rather, Eliza's, Eliza's point, point of view. view. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah. So, um, one thing you told me when, <coughs> before we met today was that when, when you were talking to publishers in New York, mm -hmm. one story they wanted to take out, which to my mind is a, you know, a key to, to the book, is the relationship of Eliza to Kayulani. Mm -hmm. uh, um, what was their rationale for taking yeah. them? Actually, there were, there were a few people along the way, along this process, who suggested taking Kayulani out of the book. And I did try to rewrite it that way without Ka'iolani and the whole thing just sort of collapsed. It just <laughs> wasn't a story because without Ka'iolani and that friendship, there's no reason Eliza would have the relationships that she has with the royal family who are so prominently involved in this. And I, I think one or two people said, oh, you know, I don't know if there's sort of a wider audience for a book about Hawaiian royalty in the 19th century, but of course the story of the royal family and Hawaiian royalty is the story of the overthrow. So there's there's no separating the two. So I, I felt like the story wasn't intact without that. No, yeah. No. And um, the, you have quite a lot of correspondence between Kaiulani and Eliza. Mm -hmm. Is that invented or is totally it totally invented? Actual? Completely yeah. fictional. Yeah. I did read um, a lot of Kaiulani's actual letters to try to get her voice, but yes, they are fictionalized between those two women. Oh. What I think they would have said I to each other. I thought that was very successful. Thank you. No, Thank no, you. I, I appreciate that. I was looking for the footnotes. <laughs> no, <laughs> fiction. Yeah. 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 No. But I hope fiction in the true spirit of, I, I loved reading about Ka'iolani because, of course, I think every little girl who's been raised here, she's such a romantic, beautiful figure. But now looking at her through the prism of an adult woman, um, I just loved her letters and her, her voice because I think that she was sort of a bit of a woman before the times. Um, I just her words jumped off of the page and her spirit jumps off of the page and her strength and I, I think she would have been a really amazing queen. 
you know what's surprising to me, and maybe mm. as a project for you, is mm. I don't think there's a good biography of her. Mm. Mm. Uh, and it's odd because, or, or, or even a, a novel based directly about her. Uh, they're usually very sentimental. Um, or the, uh, there's a lot of ideology attached to mm -hmm. her, her situation. Um, what do you think? Do you is, you know, is it I, possible? I really enjoyed the books that have been written about her, and I was so appreciative of having them. Um, and they, they, I, I felt like they gave me a really good sense of who she was. I think actually you've touched on something, which in addition to not wanting to uh, sort of appropriate the overthrow as if I knew everything about it, I also didn't want to write about that character in a way as if I knew everything about her. And so I think having Eliza as the narrator and it being set in a friendship made me feel like it was okay to write about this tremendous, you know, real life human being. I might be a little overwhelmed trying to take on Ka'iolani because she is such a, um, an amazing and, and almost poetic figure in Hawaiian history that I can see why it would be uh, intimidating, you know. Have you seen the films about her? Yes, yeah. and actually a good friend was involved um, in the making of that film, and I thought it, the film was lovely. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, no, I thought what you captured was was uh, the sense of two girls who had grown up together mm -hmm. and, and had grown up uh, and had that same that kind of intimacy that you can only get from that kind of a long friendship. Yeah, that's very kind, and I did want that. And it is dedicated to Heather Ho, and she is um, one of the people that I feel lucky to have had that kind of friendship with. And so I did want to give it that spirit. And I hope women, when they read this book, sort of recognize those best friends that you have that you really, you know, that you can really count on, and that no matter what happens in your life, you know, in the book they're apart for quite a few years. But once they're together again, they have that same feeling of honesty and, and complete trust with one another. And, and I did want that to be in the book. Yeah. You even bring Robert Louis Stevenson into mm -hmm. it, you know. And I that love must him. Have been fun. Yeah, that was so much fun because he's <laughs> such a wonder. He yeah. was such a fabulous character. Yeah. And um, I, I was so sort of thrilled to get to write about him. And again, very intimidating. But, you know, why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. And those quotes are real. Uh, um, I, well, I, I've got dialogue from him that is completely fictionalized in that one scene in which they're sort of reunited in Nu'uanu um, after she's come back from Molokai. But I think that the passage of poetry I have him saying yes, was, that's, that's is real. his. Yes, so I, I definitely, and I, I believe that I mentioned him offering to give a, a young girl his birthday. And um, I read in several biographies that he had, in fact, done yeah. that in Samoa. So a lot of it is based on reality. Yeah. Oh, he's a fabulous character. Yes, he is. So uh, this somewhat sad book, in a way. Mm -hmm. you no, know, you know, What's next? You know, I, it is a sad <clears throat> book, and yet I felt at the end, by the end, that it was happy. I felt as if, well, Eliza, I felt, had emerged. Well, satisfyingly as, sad. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, felt, I felt like it was, uh, for me, a bit of what real life would have been like, yeah, right? Yeah. At, at that point, life was hard for women. They were not the, the creators of our, their own mm -hmm. lives. They were told what they were going to be doing. And I feel as if, by the end, Eliza has um, become a very strong person in her own right and sort of mm -hmm. earned what she has. But um, now I am working on... Um, something that's completely different. It's a young adult and it's set in a museum and it's inspired by having a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old and going to a lot of museums. Oh. And I kind I started looking for books that I might be able to give my children that would get them to be more interested in going to museums. And uh, so I'm working on that. Yeah. And what, what fascinates you particularly about museums? I just, I, <laughs> my poor kids. They have been dragged to every I museum. I couldn't get my kids into museums. Yeah, I think they're at the breaking point. It's going to take a book <laughs> to get them to another museum. Um, I personally love them. They have always been very cooperative. We're starting to reach saturation point on museums. So I'm hoping something like this introduces a, a bit of a sci-fi element to museums. Um, you know, we'll see. Yeah. I, th I think one of the most fabulous museums is the Bishop Museum. I love Bishop Museum. Which is a museum of a yeah. museum. Yes, yes, you know, it's yes. A, it's like a perfect uh, um, Victorian museum. I agree, you know, yes, you know, absolutely. No, It's interesting, the person who's going to run it is the one who, re, who refurbished it, renovated it, the new president. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, you know. mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so that doesn't require a lot of research, but it was your agony for the first book, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, no, uh, 
the the first book. This was ten years of research, and and it was it was like going to law school on uh, you know an element a, a specific at, at period night. of time. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was. But I I loved it, and it has made living in Hawaii all the the richer for me. You know, things have a lot more meaning for me now, um, and the things I didn't notice before. And and I. I'm sort of hoping in, in some way for some people that the book might do that for them. You know, uh, in terms of we have so many visitors who come to Hawaii and enjoy the beauty, but there's a, there's a, there are a lot of stories here that I'm not sure everyone can pick up on within a week of visiting. And so I had hoped that perhaps um, this might be one of the books that brings some I, of that for I, them. In, in my experience, when visitors come, people who I think are quite sophisticated, and I tell them the story of the overthrow, or say, go go look at the Bishop Museum, mm -hmm. which is basically yeah. that story, and they are absolutely astonished. Mm -hmm. exactly. When I tell them that the Bishop Museum is telling the same story as the Holocaust Museum in Washington, yes. only over a much longer yes. time period, yes. they are absolutely amazed. I you know, completely you know. uh, agree. I send everyone I can yeah. uh, who's visiting to the Bishop Museum, and they're always blown away, one, by how absolutely beautiful the yeah. Hawaiian Hall is and it, that room takes my breath away every time and two by the the story it tells and, and how many people don't know that story yeah. outside of Hawaii and it, actually that was one of my biggest thrills was how supportive the museum's been of the book the minute I contacted them and, and got in touch they immediately you know uh, supported the book put it in the bookstore or doing a, a, a book signing for it and I really appreciate you know how much they've embraced the book made me feel really good about it and I thank them because I don't think the book would exist without that museum because so many of the objects in the book are ones that were inspired yeah. by their collection yeah I'm uh, going to wrap up, wrap up now, but uh, you've got some book signings coming up at uh, Namea. Uh, Namea else? with a wonderful Miley Meyer and Bishop Museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, just finished one uh, for bookends and, and finished one for Barnes & Noble. All of the local bookstores have been just really amazing. Yeah. Well, that's great. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a new bookstore about to open um, yes. in uh, Kaimuki. It's Which called Dust. The shop. Yes, with and best. And I hope press. they're going to stock the book. Uh, yes, Not we've already good. spoken about it, and they've been yeah, wonderful. Yeah. They're a wonderful group. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Thank you for having yeah. me. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.